Okay, I think we can go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the webinar on content performance dashboarding. I'm Adam Good. I'm a senior strategist here at Parsons CKO, and I'm joined by my colleague Rick Richards, who is an analyst uh, at, at Parsons CKO. Um, I'm going to be handing it off to him about midway through the presentation to really dive deep into a dashboard, um, a dashboard uh, um, that you can use to evaluate your content. As we're going through uh, the the webinar, a couple uh, you know housekeeping points: um, microphones have been muted, cameras have been turned off. Uh, you can post questions in the chat, and we'll review them during Q and A segment. Um, and we'll be keeping an eye on chat as well if it seems like something that we can dive into and address directly while we're talking. Uh, the next point is that the webinar is being recorded. Um, we'll distribute this after the session as well as this deck, um, particularly the upfront section. Um, there's uh, some sort of high level uh, points about data strategy and, and KPI uh, approaches to KPIs that we won't spend a ton of time on, um, but has some good resources in there for you afterwards. So if you want to go to the next slide. So just a little bit about Parsons CKO, if you're not familiar with us, um, we help teams accomplish more with their audiences. That take, <laughs> takes a wide variety of forms, but uh, at, at heart it's consulting and helping organizations figure out you know, what they need to do to engage with their audiences more effectively. Oftentimes that looks at uh, road mapping, so where organizations are with their communications and engagement capabilities and where they need to go. Um, that includes looking at the technical platforms that make up your engagement architecture uh, and advising how you can improve, <laughs> enhance, replace, uh, et cetera, all the things with your, your platforms. Uh, and we also focus, uh, uh, Rick and I in particular, uh, on data strategy. So how can you uh, understand uh, your audiences more, understand their behavior, and better leverage that data to uh, increase your effectiveness with your audiences? So we're going to the next slide. And this is a cool little graphic that talks about how we see possibilities. Uh, we have um, our philosophy of engagement architecture, which really uh, values um, looking holistically at the people, processes, and platforms that connect and work well together uh, to help you uh, deliver experiences to your audiences and to increase engagement with them, all aligned around a core strategy. So the, the uh, webinar today will be a little bit about data strategy um, um, and then how you can get your people together um, around uh, processes uh, and platforms uh, to better look at content performance for your websites. So whenever we're talking about um, you know, a platform or a process or someone in your organization, we think of those three as kind of like a tripod that really helps drive your engagement efforts. Uh, next. All right, so we want to start with a little, a uh, couple minutes about um, data strategy um, before we dive into the, to the dashboard. Um, the reason that these words are in two different colors, uh, big and bold, is that um, to emphasize different aspects of data strategy. So if you're not using your data strategically, it's just data. Um, and if you have a strategy that does not have data, well, it's not as effective as it could be. Um, so when we, whenever we look at uh, data or analytics, we think about data strategy. So what do you want to do with your audiences and how can you get data that will help you do that? So you go to the next slide, we kind of think of um, uh, sort of four requirements or four elements of data strategy work. Um, and, you know, without, you know, if any one of these four is missing or is underperforming, um, your data strategy isn't, isn't complete or it's not going to be doing as much for you as you would like. Uh, so the first element is strategy definition, which is really what are you trying to do? What are you trying to accomplish um, that you can use data to, uh, to improve? Uh, two is tracking. So once you know what you want to accomplish, you need to figure out how you can track all of that information and interaction. Uh, three is reporting. So how do you report effectively on those strategic metrics that you've identified and set up uh, to track on your various systems? Um, how is that report received? How is that report used? Uh, and that leads to adoption and optimization. So really creating uh, a culture of data within your organization. So data that isn't tracked, doesn't exist, data that isn't reported on or adopted or used um, might as well not have been uh, worth tracking in the first place. Um, and that's what a big focus of today's webinar is. 
around the reporting piece, um, particularly when it comes to content performance on your website. And go to the next slide. Yeah, and actually, just before we jump, because I'll, I'll come back to this in a little bit, but uh, you know, if any red flags are going up for you here, that, that's probably good because um, we're talking about data strategy and not just analytics. When, when people say, oh, we're doing analytics well, or we're really focused on analytics, they tend to be talking about number two and number three. Um, and that's all well and good, but if you don't have the strategy definition, uh, you're not going to have metrics that matter necessarily. Maybe you'll accidentally get some. We'll look at that a little bit later. But um, And that adoption and optimization piece, um, you can have the best tracking uh, set up. You can have all kinds of customizations. You can have really elaborate reports, uh, but if your organization doesn't trust the data um, and doesn't act on the data, then ultimately it's it's kind of a waste of time and, and the, the data can languish and then can answer questions wrongly later down the road when someone else finds it, uh, when it's not being actively maintained. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, and another point I'll make here is that um, when we talk about analytics or data strategy, we're talking holistically about all the different sources of data uh, that your organization has access to, not just website analytics. We will be focusing specifically on content performance of your website today, uh, but there are many, many sources of data that are really valuable um, from your CRM to your email system, to your fundraising databases, whatever the case may be. Um, there's hopefully data there <laughs> that, that you can and should leverage uh, in a strategic uh, framework. Uh, so we'll be focusing again on the, the website piece of things today, but know that it is all connected and it becomes more valuable the more that you can understand all those different sources of data. So I wanted to put this up there just to talk about uh, you know the different roles that analytics can play in your organization. I'm really thinking about that uh, adoption and optimization piece uh, that Rick mentioned because if you're if you're collecting all this information but you're not doing anything with it, um, then you're you're really not you're you're not you're not you're not doing anything with it. You're not getting the value out of out of that data or that activity. So here are some different roles that analytics can play in your organization. So one of them is storytelling. So this is really about understanding your audiences and demonstrating impact um, with good data about engagement. And it can help you figure out what types of stories you should be telling to audiences at what, at what times. Um, Mythbuster is always a favorite one. So if there are hot debates about whether certain tactics work better than, other, uh, uh, than others, uh, analytics and data is a place to sort of bring a, a, um, a neutral third party of data <laughs> to the table. Um, speaking of table, coffee table, uh, the idea is that these should be conversations. Um, your metrics and your reporting should generate good conversations uh, that will inspire your teams to, uh, to improve their efforts and, and share what they've learned. Um, you know, it's not just, here's the number, great, Next month, I'll show you another number. Um, it's all about having the conversation and what those kinds of kinds of, uh, what those kinds of conversations can enable. Uh, and air traffic control data can um, really play a valuable uh, a valuable role in helping you improve your targeting and automation. Um, it can help you identify from from this vast audience or audiences that you have. What are the appropriate segments that you need to be uh, engaging with? Um, what tactics are working with specific segments? Um, so it really gives you a, a more fine-tuned sense of, of who you're engaging with. Yeah, and I, I don't wanna, we, we have these four here, but I just wanna speak to the, the power of convening. You know, we talked a little bit about the coffee table, but really all of these are ways to convene uh, with the data at your organization, build that organizational trust and start um, really becoming a data champion, which, um, it, the, the end goal there, the epic level is when uh, you're just implicitly trusted. I think there's a lot of folks who have had the experience of, I see this in the data, or I, I ran this report and I, I believe this is true. Um, and people don't believe you. Uh, other teams say that that doesn't match my numbers. I, I know this, I know this stuff really well, or uh, the executive teams will not, you know, will say, well, well, this contradicts uh, things we've looked at before, or this isn't, you know, uh, in the job description of, of where we want to head, we keep that data in, in a different system, et cetera. Um, so the more that you can convene teams and build that um, consensus around around items and around understanding, uh, the, the greater your trust, your organizational trust in the data uh, grows and the easier it is uh, to do these things. And, and the, the one story I always like to tell is uh, Smitty, 
um, which we have a, a nice case study of on our website where um, a, uh, but one organization found the metrics that they were always, they always wanted to pull leads before a meeting, different people didn't have time, et cetera. Uh, we helped them build that automated tool and they actually, uh, it was named the social media intelligence tool. And then they renamed it Smitty because they, uh, they realized they had to invite Smitty to all of uh, a certain type of meeting. Uh, and so the dashboard became an attendee and a, a critical attendee uh, who brought the data that, uh, that made the meeting possible every time. So um, yeah, don't, don't sleep on convening powers <laughs> with your data. Yeah, absolutely. And I think another critical piece there is, um, uh, you know, who's going to be seeing the report and why, in what context, what do you want them to do with it? And what kind of conversation do you want to have? Okay, uh, so the next section, I'm just going to talk high level about metrics and KPIs, sort of some philosophical underpinnings for how do you identify, um, how should you look for uh, metrics, how she, you should understand metrics, uh, knowing that in a few minutes we'll, we'll uh, switch very specifically to, uh, to website metrics and content performance metrics. Um, but I really like to stress some of the, the sort of philosophical underpinnings of our approach uh, to, um, to metrics and KPIs. So a, a couple key uh, sort of weird cheesy acronyms um, that I like to come up with. So uh, why we use KPIs, cap me, cap me. Remember the phrase cap me. Um, these uh, will show you uh, what's, what's valuable about KPIs. So curation, so they help you focus on data that matters, that's the C. Um, you have so much data at your fingertips, particularly if you have Google Analytics sort of set up out of the box, there's way more data than you need or that you can, you know, uh, um, that you need to focus on, that you need to think about. So curation helps you really focus on the data that matters uh, for action. So, you know, a good KPI will help you understand what you should do next if the KPI is met or isn't met um, and how you should use your time. Um, prioritization. So what, what metrics do you prioritize are an expression of your values. What do you care about? What, what do you need to be focusing on now? Uh, management. So a good KPI will help you set and communicate clear expectations so that you don't have someone coming out of the blue saying, how many site visits did we get? Right. You are saying what we care about is engaged audiences around this piece of content. And you're setting the expectation that this is what we're going to look at. This is why it matters. Um, and then finally, obviously, evaluate. You know, a good metric will help you understand and demonstrate success. So another way of thinking about this, if you go to the next slide, um, is uh, obligatory always be closing uh, reference. Um, always be asking why. Uh, so whenever you're talking about what kinds of metrics you should be looking at, um, you, need to, you need to ask why a lot. Um, you know, why do you want to know how many visitors your site gets? Why does it matter what channel they're coming from? Why are you reporting on a bounce rate? So why is really what takes a metric, what's just a number and sort of elevates it uh, to uh, an actionable um, insight or uh, to, your, to your strategy. And if you can't get a satisfactory why, is it worth your time to track it and report on it and look at it? Um, you, know, you don't wanna just be looking at numbers for numbers sake. Um, you know, we're not, we're not abstract, pure mathematicians. I mean, maybe some of us are, I don't know all of our backgrounds, but I'm assuming that, uh, that, that we are not pure uh, abstract mathematicians that just want to look at numbers. Um, we want to look at them for specific reasons. So we go to the next slide. Another way of thinking about the metrics that you choose uh, is they tell a story. If they're, they're meaningful, they have an impact. So on the right is what we're going for. They connect outreach to outcomes. So, you know, what did you do and what happened because of it? Um, they're harsh arbiters, they're hard to move. So you can't say, hey, we want more people to like us. <laughs> we, want, we want a higher brand sentiment. Um, we, have, we want a specific uh, uh, metric that we can't sort of just switch around. Um, they're clear signs of what you should do. Again, if you're hitting it or not hitting a particular KPI, um, you should have a plan in place to look into why that is uh, and what you can learn from. Um, and then they're custom built for your, for your organization. So we'll, we'll talk about some kind of uh, sort of direct standard um, out of the box metrics that you can use with content performance, but those are gonna become more powerful the more you can tailor them to your organization. Um, and this is opposed to vanity metrics, you know, site visitors, 
email signups, things that are just, you know, look big and impressive, they're easier to get. Um, they don't necessarily connect to your mission, right? I, I assume that, um, you know, most people on this call are not, do not have a site that is monetized based on people just getting on the site. So you're not monetizing page views. Um, you are probably hoping that people will donate or that people will take an advocacy action. So you are trying to get to impact metrics that tell the, the story of the impact of your work. All right, if you go to the next slide. And you've probably heard of the, the SMART metric, you know, is your KPI specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound? I won't spend a lot of time on this, um, uh, spend some more time with this later, but it's a fairly well-known framework. Um, you know, you really need a, a, a KPI that is specific, that you can measure, that you think you can achieve, um, that it's relevant to uh, what you're doing now, and that it's that's time bound, um, that, you know, you can focus on it for a particular period of time. Um, a lot of times will we'll, um, help organizations think about what sort of quarterly reporting they want to do. And there are some metrics that they might want to report on every single, single quarter, but there are many metrics that aren't relevant for three quarters of the year. Maybe they're relevant for a specific point in time. So you always want to think about uh, you know, what your organization or what your team's uh, priorities are um, as, you're, uh, as you're thinking of your metrics. Where we go to next. So that's KPIs uh, generally. Again, the focus of this webinar is going to be on content performance on your website. Um, why do we tend to focus on website? Well, it's one of the places where you know, most of your outreach has in common. You're directing people to your website. People are discovering your website. Um, it's where, for most organizations, your deepest content is published and kept. Um, where people come and have the deepest and you know, sort of most sensitive areas of engagement. And then, you know, it's where people are looking just to find, you know, find out about you, um, to find out who you are, what you're up to, um, you know, do, does your mission match their values. So you have a lot of things that come into your website from email, social, media mentions, etc. cetera. Um, and if you look carefully at your website, um, that can tell you a lot about types of people who are coming to you uh, and, and what they care about. Let's go to the next slide. And we'll, we'll get into to more aspects of this with the, with the dashboard, but really what we mean um, when we talk about engagement or engagement architecture is what are people actually doing when they, when they come to the website? Um, so you know, you'll see reports on page views and how many people come to the site, what pages people land on, um, but we like to get deeper into you know, what are people actually doing on, on the page? Um, and many times that can be uh, a call to action, such as donate or uh, take an advocacy action or sign up for email. Uh, but a lot of times for uh, content, there's a lot of specific, uh, specific micro interactions uh, that can be tracked. So we can see how engaging the content is. is you know, are your audiences playing that video <laughs> or how much of that video are they watching um, that your team spent a month to produce? Um, are they clicking through and viewing uh, the images in a nice image gallery that you've created? Um, are they you know, me measuring with uh, you know, or uh, interacting with data features if you've developed you know, an interactive infographic? Um, and most importantly, are they going down and reading more content? Are they actually getting to the end of the page? Um, so we like to get as sort of specific uh, and focused on uh, what engagement means, what types of interactions uh, you know, comprise engagement. Uh, and that's what we'll be starting to, to dig into here. Uh, the next slide. Yeah, and just to and just to say real quick, you know, a lot of what's what's basic from say something like Google Analytics are just going to be like page views or time on page, um, and uh, we'll we'll look at those. Uh, they are useful if that's if that's all you have. Um, but there's a wealth of information on on your site that's going to be more relevant. So even just some some basic, you know, clicking a a, a read more button lets you know how engaged people are, how long did it take them to click the read more button? Um, so you can start thinking through about your organization's content and really think of, you know, what, what do we want people to do when they're on the website? What, what do we care most about? Um, what, what counts as consumption to us? And it's probably not just a page view um, or just time on page because that can mean anything from I got up and walked away. <laughs> it was up on my screen for 20 minutes uh, or 
I, you know, this is actually something that's meant to be read in 30 seconds. And why are people spending 10 minutes on the page? It could actually be a, a bad sign. So um, all of these things are worth looking at uh, kind of in tandem and, and holistically with that strategy. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that, that holistic piece is, uh, is, is really important. And that's where getting into more context about, um, about what you are actually trying to track and what you care about is really important. Um, so instead of just saying, hey, we got 12,000 page views, um, what types of pages were viewed? <laughs> what types of content were viewed? Um, what was that content about? So maybe that content was about reopening in, in COVID. So now you know, hey, lots of people came to a page about, um, uh, about reopening. They downloaded a toolkit. They took an action. Um, those are things that are going to be unique to your organization. Uh, and the more that you can define those and set up your systems to track those, the better able you're going to be to actually dig in and get more meaningful granular data. So that you're saying, hey, all of our content about reopening versus booster shots, uh, that performed a lot better. So we can, we can learn from that. We can sort of elevate our messaging about reopening. Um, or if our booster shot uh, campaign is not getting as much content, we can look at why, what we might need to do to improve it. So that context uh, is, is absolutely critical. Okay, so um, yes, yeah, so we can yeah, jump to the next slide. Okay, so again, this is uh, this is just to show you again that the, the the wealth of data that you have is not just around your website. There are a lot of different sources of data. Again, we'll be focusing more specifically on the, the website and content performance today. Um, but you think of kind of three of the big channels that feed into your website, social, um, your email or ads. Um, you should be looking about at, at data uh, and data points around those channels as well, and particularly how they drive uh, behavior to your website. Um, so as much as possible, you want to be thinking about the holistic audience journey, you know, from where they heard about you to how they found you to what they did and how they continue to engage. Pieces of that story are going to be in different platforms. Um, pieces, you know, different platforms have different skill sets <laughs> in terms of what they can know about your audience. Um, we'll be focusing today on the website, um, you know, particularly thinking about audience reach and engagement, and then subset of content. So the more that you can layer in that context, what type of content, what topics, what regions, um, what actions did people take, uh, the, the more, uh, you know, the more valuable that data is going to be. Um, again, we'll, we'll send this deck around later. I don't want to speak too much about the different, the other data sources, um, unless Rick, you want to mention anything about that? Yeah, the, o the only thing I'll note is, is from a feasibility standpoint, um, what you see on the left here, and uh, what happened to the little clicker thing? I can't, I don't see it in the Zoom menu anymore, but um, the social e email ads website uh, are all fairly easy to automate and, and start reporting on, um, which is, you know, another great reason, like we can, we can look at this stuff and start getting immediate data on that. Uh, when you get into search tools um, for keyword and trend analysis, uh, media monitoring, um, uh, uh, actually in-person events, not just like on, on website events and uh, video and podcast data, that data lives in so many different systems and it doesn't always integrate easily or sometimes at all. Um, so it can be hard to layer layer that that data in, uh, but sometimes it's also fairly easy. You know, for uh, an example that we'll might might look at later, um, I can see search traffic in Google Analytics. I can see who's coming from organic search. I can then go to Search Console, Google Search Console, and see what people were searching for that brought them to the site and what landing page they might have wound up on. It's not directly correlated, but I can start to um, you know, tell that story and put those put those pieces together. And then when you get into surveys, research, internal data, all the way on the right here, um, that's that's even more uh, kind of custom um, and 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 harder to to bring in. So just to kind of right size your expectations for um, what we'll get into in a second here, which is think about the story you want to tell, think about who you're telling the story to, uh, and then think about the scope of data that that you have access to and the and the regularity that you want to tell that story. I guess that's, I just queued myself up. So um, <laughs> yeah, the, um, I, I'm bringing this part back up to say again, you know, number two and number three is, is analytics. That's what people are talking about. But the, um, when, when they say analytics, 
But in terms of data strategy, you, you need to make sure, number one, that the strategy definition is informing that tracking and is informing that reporting. Um, because if the metrics that you're tracking don't correlate to the KPIs in your organization, um, as Adam said, it's, you know, uh, even if you have smart goals at the organizational level, if you're not tracking against them and you're tracking something else or something kind of tangentially related, um, it, it's going to break down that trustworthiness uh, of the data in your organization and people are gonna, aren't going to rely on it. Um, the same thing with reporting. Um, people are going to want to see that you're reporting in a way that sounds the same. You know, a, a example that we talk about a lot is adding your context to something like Google Analytics, um, adding content groups or adding content types uh, into Google Analytics so that you can actually, uh, it can view the data in the same way that you organizationally would view your content, um, if that makes sense. And um, if you're, if the reporting, it can kind of mirror the strategy definition, it's gonna make adoption and optimization a lot easier because then people are gonna say, I have these goals, I've been tasked with doing these things, and now I have a report that tells me exactly how I'm doing against those goals. Um, I can use this. I can, oh, the, these, these types of content, um, content with these topic tags um, convert best for my goals. So if I want to improve the goals I've been uh, tasked with organizationally, I can look at that number and I can watch it move and I can push content that should drive uh, more of those things. So. Uh, always start with a reporting charter when you're when you're building a report, and um, we're we're having a bit of a cooking show moment where we kind of uh, tell you how we're doing all this, and then bend down and say, and here's what the finished product looks like. Um, so there is a content performance dashboard template which we'll be sharing as part of this uh, the PDF here that you can click on and add uh, your own information, or uh, you can pair it with your own Google Analytics account if you have that, and it'll pull in data. Um, it should be based around uh, mostly items that are available out of the box. And obviously we've talked about a number of things here of saying out of the box is, is decent, but you should go go bigger, go, uh, go custom and something that speaks um, to your organizational understanding of, of content and uh, different things on your website. But starting with this reporting charter, um, thinking about uh, we're not just building a dashboard and throwing all kinds of charts on. We're not trying to answer a hundred different questions from a hundred different stakeholders. Um, we're telling a story. And right now we have stakeholders that want to evaluate the performance of website content um, by curating metrics that reflect the goals and intent of the content. In other words, they, that there was an editorial team. They said, we're writing this content because we want it to accomplish X, Y, and Z. And so we want to be able to look at that um, in the dashboard so that they can go back to their editorial planning and content production meetings um, and have the numbers in front of them and see what's working and see what's not see where they should invest more, see where they should invest less, et cetera. Um, so in just a moment, we'll jump over and, and I'll show you kind of what this uh, dashboard template looks like. Um, and then afterwards, there is, I think, another hour for uh, the workshop uh, or like a, a working session uh, where we can show you how to get that set up and, and play around with it more and talk about customizations and stuff like that. Um, so feel free to stick around. I think the link will get passed around um, sometime shortly uh, for, for you all to join. Another thing to consider with dashboards as you're, as you're telling this is, um, is again, that, that audience of, um, is this going to executive stakeholders that want to get an email every, once a month that just says, here are the key metrics we identified and here's how they're all doing and here's the trend over time. Um, and again, this can be, this is something that's easily automated. It's ready to review immediately the second someone opens it or it can just be sent out via email or, or you know, uh, published on the website or something like that. Versus a flexible and exploratory one. Um, is this something that, you know, that power of convening, right? We're going to have a meeting once a month or even once a week where we look at how a campaign is doing. And we'll want to slice and dice that in different ways. We want to say, well, how, how are these uh, champions that we, we uh, partnered with to uh, promote our content? How are they doing? Um, let's, let's look at each of those individually. How are different um, channels working? You know, we had a um, big push on social media last week. So let's look at Facebook, let's look at Twitter individually and, and, and start uh, breaking those down and evaluating them as a team. So the dashboard can be a tool that is actually allowing you to explore data quickly and rapidly um, with your team, or it can be a report that just is kind of one and done, set and forget it. And it, 
yeah, it populates the key information that you need. Often we go somewhere in between. Um, people will want sort of something, a, a pretty consistent report, but with a couple couple boxes. Let me change, be able to change the date range. Uh, let me be able to change, um, you know, a member type or a, uh, a content type, something like that, and see how that aspect is performing. And uh, and also as you're as you're thinking through how to develop this sort of dashboard, um, not just think about the story you're telling and who you're telling it to, but you know, what in the organization is this going to address? Is it all content? Is it all website content? Is it content for editorial purposes? Is it content for a certain team? Um, is it event content that drives people to register for events? Um, and then that will help you. That'll inform what data points you need and from which platforms. Um, because as I mentioned earlier, you have all kinds of different systems and you might be predominantly looking at um, website content and, and evaluating that, but you might also want to go and pull some numbers from the other platforms. Um, you know, an easy one is this is an email based campaign. Um, here were our open rates and our click through rates that we can put on the dashboard. And now let's see how that what that translates to um, within the, uh, the website performance from that channel. Uh, what will your dashboard look like? This uh, probably sounds really silly. It'll look like a dashboard, right? But um, get, get, take a moment to get some inspiration. Um, and see what people are looking at. If, uh, if it's a crowd that, that really loves infographics, you can make it more colorful and more fun and, and have it uh, sort of weave the data in um, and tell stories that way. It might make it more engaging. If it's, um, if it's an audience that is, you know, wants something very cut and dry, uh, don't do that. <laughs> give them give them a very uh, bog standard old school uh, dashboard with you know like basic branding and and um, make it feel like like theirs, like it uh, belongs to the organization and uh, isn't isn't surprising in any way. Uh, people are going to trust that data more if it comes to them in uh, the format that they're expecting and that they they see other data in. So look to other reports and other other sources. Uh, ask ask the people who will be using it. How do you like to receive your data? What, let me see some examples and, and base it on that. And then that gets to that last part. Who's gonna use it? How often are they gonna use it? Uh, and how will it be maintained? Because uh, one of the, the dangerous things with data is you start tracking, you start collecting, um, you build a report and then no one, it doesn't go anywhere and you walk away from it. And then six months later, a year later, three years later, someone opens it up and says, what is what is this? I what, what does that mean? I, that that doesn't look right. And now your report that has languished and not been maintained um, has you know called into question other tracking opportunities or other uh, data that's been collected um, along the way uh, because it's wrong, you know, or it wasn't uh, wasn't updated with all of the things that have changed over the course of those three years. Um, so make sure you have some plan to uh, to keep keep looking at it. Uh, make sure it, it's uh, it's functioning correctly or deprecate it if it's no longer needed. Um, that's a big thing with data. Um, if it hasn't, uh, review it once a year. If it hasn't been needed in two years, uh, get rid of it or mark it for deprecation so that people can see when they're using it. Uh, they kind of have to cross that line of caution tape of like, okay, I, I, I know I can't rely on this, but I'm going to look at it for you know just my own sake anyway. Uh, so yeah, using the using the dashboard, um, and I think here, let's see if I can get here and then flip to this piece. Uh, so when you click on this link, um, you will come to this dashboard. And um, actually, that's maybe look the best uh, full screen. Apologies for my gigantic monitor, uh, but. Uh, when we look at this, we can click the use template button. If you follow the link, it should come straight here. Uh, you click the use template and then add a new data source, whatever you would like from your own uh, Google. Um, it should populate with any Google accounts you have access to. Uh, and then you just click copy report and I'm gonna copy it with the same data in it because it's Google's sample account and I don't need to worry about that. Um, and you'll be in an edit mode where you can move all kinds of stuff around. You may not want to do that right away, but you can just go to the view mode. And this is how a typical user would experience uh, your dashboard. Um, you will probably want to change the name because you don't need copy of yada yada. Um, but 
what this dashboard looks at is a number of uh, kind of out of the box standard uh, GA um, information uh, that you can use to start evaluating um, aspects of your, your website and how your content is performing. Uh, so these top level stats are ones you, uh, you may be familiar with if you've already looked at web analytics data. Um, we have users and we have page views. Um, page views are are just views. Um, users are the, the visitors to your site. Um, we also have pages per session. Uh, this number is interesting because uh, sometimes you might have a site where you actually just want people to read something quickly and then leave. Uh, and if the pages per session are really high, then it means that people are poking around and looking at a bunch of different things. A session is basically one visit to your website. Uh, so people might be poking around and looking at a bunch of pages. Um, before they find what they're looking for or realize that it was on page one. So it might be a UX thing um, that you could you can address there. Alternatively, and I think this is a Google's um, site here, yeah, is a, is a kind of e-commerce based site. Uh, you probably want multiple page views per session because that means they saw an item, added it to their cart, went to the checkout page and checked out. That's, that's probably four pages right there. Um, so you have to have that level of context to, to start filling that in. Uh, and, and unfortunately, dashboards are easy to add kind of annotations to. So this is just um, a little note that I explained all that with uh, that you just add, you know, in the in the edit mode. Um, that's a really great use of, uh, of the dashboard is, is coming back and telling that story. Don't just put the number there, um, explain why it's important and how, how your, um, your viewers should read it. Uh, but what's available here, um, you know, number one, we can look at how many people that we have coming um, over this current uh, date range. I think the default is 28 days, uh, the auto date range there. Uh, but you can set it to a number of things or do a customized one uh, if you would like. And then what that'll do is it'll compare um, how many visitors you got in this period. And actually here you can see it's from about September 29th through October 26th. Um, so it'll show us the daily average um, for visitors, daily average for page views, uh, the pages per session. We'll also see the bounce rate. Uh, bounce rate is people who are just leaving your site um, immediately uh, when they when they just land on it. Uh, and then an average time on page. And uh, you know this one, I include it because uh, people like to uh, reference it a lot. It's uh, again just you know standard out of the box. It's one of the few kind of engagement uh, or kind of next level uh, metrics you have when we're talking about page views. It's not just, did they visit it, but did they bounce, did they leave immediately? How long did they spend on the page? When you're looking overall at the site, uh, it's a little bit tricky because, um, you know, generally like our homepage, uh, for example, we would expect someone to spend a couple of seconds there and then click on the link that they actually want to go to and then read more there and then have a, a higher, uh, time on page on that. Uh, and one of the ways we get around that is, you know, going back to that exploratory versus uh, standard uh, straight narrative here is we have this page drop down, So we could actually select an individual page. Um, and if we click that now, we're all of our metrics are going to update. And we're just going to see the daily average for visitors to that page and the page, the number of pages um, average for that. Um, Pages per session gets a little weird when you start looking at uh, pages, but I, I believe this is number of pages per session for someone who viewed this particular page. Um, and you have a bounce rate for that page and then average time on page just for that for that one page. Uh, so it's a bit more focused here. Uh, one thing that I didn't touch on is this 2020 benchmark. So we set up this uh, kind of neat little thing here where it compares the date range to the same date range one year previous. Um, so if you had a bunch of people come last year because of some coronavirus information you had provided, uh, you might see a drop. Or if you provide a lot of information about live events, you might see a huge boost this year. Um, but this can be a useful way to kind of just immediately get some context around your numbers. Are we doing good? Are we doing average? Are we noticing a huge you know, change? Um, uh, which is good for investigating, right? If the bounce rate suddenly drops or goes up, uh, what's causing that? 
Um, do we have the same number of visitors, but way higher pages per session? Okay, what, what's, what's going on? Are people having trouble finding things? Is our content suddenly more engaging? Um, there's a number of, of ways to read into that. And the, the timeline here uh, can actually show, uh, show this day by day, right? And so we can see that the trend line is pretty similar. So the green, the dark green is users and the dark, the dark orange is page views. And that light green and light orange are users and page views for uh, the previous year. So we can see that there's a pretty similar trend, right? Uh, the spikes happen at about the same time. Um, nothing really out of line, but if you, you know, this one right here, there was a little dip or a little jump, I should say, uh, in page views on, what is this, October 16th. Um, and then there was, uh, see these, these all kind of correlate. Um, and then here we, we have another one where it didn't quite follow um, the same, the same trajectory. So I would want to investigate spikes like this or dips uh, alternatively. Um, was there a big content push? Did we get a media mention that day? Um, was there an email that was sent out that we can tra trace it back to? Um, those are all good things to, to dive into and just to start to get a sense of how are other factors in the organization uh, and particularly in communications um, or factors outside your organization. Somebody tweeted about us, uh, somebody shared an article. Um, start to get a broader sense of how, how that's impacting. So there's a, uh, yeah. Good, good to follow anything you can see there with uh, you know kind of trend lines that don't that, that's a kind of suddenly deviate from the the other trends. Uh, and what this would translate to here is it looks like um, here you know there was a dip in and this is in 2020. There's a dip in page views, uh, but not really a dip in users. So for some reason, the users that were coming on this day were less interested in content. Uh, and then the, the, you can actually see this spike isn't a spike so much as it just kind of resets to that, that basic trend line. So, you know, little things like that are good to, to investigate, see if there was an outage, see if there was a, a different ad campaign or, or something going on there. Uh, the one other item here, and this is a kind of an edit, edit mode uh, thing, but I'll show you real quick, is that you can set this goal line. You can have as many goal lines as you want. Um, but this is another way uh, that's helpful for viewers um, to, uh, you know, we've got a, an average page view line here, and then we've got a uh, views goal here. And it's a constant value of 100, and obviously this is way higher, so let's set it at 1500. And now it's, uh, it's halfway through the page there. So when we go back to view, if I'm, if I'm a report viewer, I can say, oh, here is the goal that, I, that was set by my department or by my team, uh, and I can see how often the line is going above or below that. And, and you know, in general, if that was actually our views goal, uh, we're, we're way off, we, you know, here we did something good, uh, but in general, uh, we need, to, we need to, to boost our trend way higher. Um, and the nice thing is that, that that is fairly movable and that you can have, you know, a couple of lines as needed. Let's see, how we doing? Yeah, we've got a couple of minutes here. Um, so we talked about these metrics, talked about the trend line. Uh, engagement spotlight, these are any events that you do have configured on your site. We talked about a couple, uh, an event on the site is just any interaction. Uh, so it can be anything from play the video to made it to 50% of the video, to scroll to 50% of the page, to click the button. Um, anything and everything that kind of happens on your site in some way can could be captured as a custom event uh, with the right, <laughs> the right sort of uh, additional development there. Um, and you can see here that they've just got uh, some basic ones. There's a e-commerce functionality that you can just turn on in Google Analytics that I believe pulls in a couple uh, events on its own without a lot of additional um, coding. Excuse me. And then the contact us, it looks like they just have a, a, a button uh, for when somebody wants to contact something, uh, contact the team with, with help. Uh, that's great too. Um, and I believe uh, and the nice thing is if you narrow this down to an individual page, you could start to get a sense of how many times are people clicking for support on particular pages? Um, and you could start to unravel, is that page confusing? Um, are people, is this flow confusing? Is this page at you know step two or step three in a particular checkout flow and people are clicking on support there because there's, there's something that's just not right or not working or not clear in the UX. Um, so you can start to really uh, kind of dive in and, and get some, information there um, if you can trigger a couple basic events like that. 
the other one I want to chat about is this uh, traffic source. Traffic sources here. Uh, this is this is huge. Um, and uh, I'll go ahead and say we'll you know we'll play with this a little bit later. Uh, this is everything. Yeah, this is all, all pages again. Uh, so if I was to click paid search, um, it would actually filter this report again. And um, now it's going to show me trend lines and metric averages just based around uh, this one slice of traffic. Um, so I want to uh, I want to analyze the paid search. I want to know how people are, you know, how many users is that representing? Um, do we see uh, a bump in paid users or uh, a, a, a decrease in paid users? In, in the, um, and, and yeah, it's looking like we're seeing more page views, but less pages per session, which would, yeah, probably mean um, almost almost triple uh, the, the daily users uh, and a higher bounce rate. Um, so, you know, probably, uh, looks like we got some low data there, um, but this could potentially be an outage. I mean, you definitely want to have uh, clear date ranges on your reports of, you know, don't trust this data past or before this point, something like that. Uh, that could be part of it, that it wasn't capturing complete data, or it could mean we're running heavier um, promotional campaigns. And it means now that we're going to get a lot more users that weren't actually that interested and just saw a flashy ad and clicked on it and went, oh, this is what I want, and closed it right away. Um, you have to have some of that context around uh, campaign planning and um, again, the external or the internal factors uh, within your organization to know to know what's going on there. Uh, but the nice thing is that you also can drill down here um, and that should give us, I think for paid search, we'll probably just see, yeah, Google CPC. So if you ran multiple different channel ads or multiple different ads, uh, that would shake out in here and we'd start seeing that on the pie chart. Uh, this data is fairly basic. So it's Google, they're only running Google ads for a Google page, go figure. Um, okay, so we look at that and uh, I'll just step to these real quick here. Uh, this page is, I really love the stack by bar chart here because you can start to get a sense of your top pages. Um, so, okay, let's see. Uh, okay, store is our fourth most visited page and most of the traffic is from direct, but also, again, we have a kind of a, a chunkier piece of uh, the paid search uh, compared to other pages, which, you know, if that's your campaign and that's where paid search traffic is meant to go, that's a good sign. Um, or referral is meaning links from other people that are driving traffic to your site. Uh, you could get surprised and see like, oh, this, uh, you know, a big, a big slice of this is coming from referral traffic. So I wonder why this, this partner, this, these websites are sending traffic to us. If you didn't have that in your plan, you weren't expecting it, uh, another good thing to, to track down and see what's going on there. Uh, we can also see uh, this kind of a, just another view of this stack bar chart. Um, not only the number of total number of page views, which again, will be uh, sorted by the top there, uh, but also how many people entered there. Um, that is the entrance percentage. So 66.6% .6 of um, page views were entrances to the, uh, the site and you see I, I hovered there too. <laughs> it's already bad to make sure it was interested by pages, not by users. Um, but the, uh, yeah, so 66.6% .6 of visits to the homepage uh, were entrances, uh, but that means that there was, a, you know, nearly what, 35, about 35% 35 of people that navigated to the homepage and didn't enter there or backtracked to the homepage. Uh, so, you know, another thing to, to evaluate. Uh, men's apparel, uh, if you're pushing that one, you can see that, you know, almost 20% of traffic of the page views uh, actually just landed straight there. If that was a campaign you were running, then that might be a good sign, or you might have been expecting, you know, 80%. Um, so you've got to set uh, goals that are specific to the pages themselves uh, and know, know what the expectations are as you evaluate this. Uh, but then you can also see the bounce rate by page here. Uh, and one other thing I'll just mention real quick is the source and pathway analysis one. Um, we hear a lot from folks that they want to be able to understand, you know, when someone landed on this particular page, where did they go next? Uh, and so the way you would do that here, let's say it's this basket.html one. Um, let's search for that. Actually, this is a little bit tricky the way this works. You uncheck everything first look for basket.html, you can see there's a couple, um, the, the dot and the plus and the single 
single user um, that, that came to those that was obviously a typo of some kind, but we'll go ahead and check them all, all four of those, uh, just to include them all for this purpose. Uh, and then you can see um, for anyone who viewed those pages, uh, here's where they landed. Here's uh, maybe where they were coming from. There should be an entrance one because it looks like there were a lot of entrances there. Um, but you can also see that a lot of them were coming from the home page or from the store page or from some of these quick view pages. Uh, and then I think this is, yeah, these are just the, the pages themselves. So you can start to just see that in the chart of how that particular page performed. That is a, a super quick high level look at um, all of these metrics that are available to you out of the box. Um, and so there's a lot of really powerful, powerful stuff in here. Um, but beyond that, um, we've also got uh, a lot of the customizations that we talked about earlier. Um, so there we go. Uh, these are some common ones that we've seen that, that you might already be thinking you need or, or would be interested in seeing in that, in that sort of dashboard. Um, are there uh, filters or calculated fields uh, that I could use to narrow that report experience? And a good example is that, that page one at the top. Um, we've had a couple of people come back to us and say, oh, all of my pages, you know, everything for this team has slash sustainability in it. Okay, great. Well, that's, you can actually teach Google to, I mean, you can search for it in the, the page filter. That's one way to do it. Uh, but you can teach Google to understand that anything that lives at slash sustainability or under in the subdirectory in the URL string uh, is sustainability content. And then you can have um, a nice report uh, that, with a, uh, should say a nice drop down that you can click on to just filter immediately by sustainability content becomes very user friendly. Also, anyone going into Google Analytics could then um, add that dimension and just quickly uh, modify any of the, the standard reports to look at just sustainability content, which gets into that grouping by taxonomic data. Um, if that's available in your URLs, you can start to uh, pull it in immediately. Um, and there's ways to do that within Google Analytics and within the, the filters uh, um, on the report. But also there are even, uh, if you have a WordPress-based site, there are WordPress plugins to quickly start uh, pushing that data in via GTM, Google Tag Manager. Um, it's a good, uh, I think Google is now recommending that for, for all setups to just do uh, load analytics code by GTM. Uh, audience segments, another big one there. Um, we can uh, start to understand the audiences who is coming to the site based on what they viewed. Uh, so if, you've, if you're capturing that taxonomic data, you can say, show me an audience of anyone who views sustainability content. How did they perform on the site versus all of our other, um, our, all of our other traffic? Or if you've got another taxonomic, how did sustainability work versus, um, I don't know, pollution? <laughs> um, and, and, and yeah. Get the Captain Planet and the uh, I forget what the Captain Planet Evil's Nemesis was the alternate Captain Planet. But you can see the two teams there. Uh, you can also look at intended audience. Um, if we've got that taxonomic data, um, did the people who I intended to see this content actually view it, and did they like it better than the other audiences that are coming and viewing this page? Uh, link tagging is another one. Uh, UTMs are the basic one. Uh, that's ready to go already. That wasn't in the um, in the dashboard that we just showed you, uh, but you could easily add that uh, by just adding, you know, campaign or medium, um, and I think even content. Um, you can quickly get a sense of how to traffic coming from particular campaigns or from particular uh, people. I have shared a link to broadcast out. Uh, how did that perform? Uh, how did that look compared to every other? Uh, group on that was coming to the site. Uh, you can, uh, there are default channel groupings that you saw there on that pie chart, uh, you know, email, social, uh, paid uh, search, et cetera. Um, but you don't have to use, those are default ones. So you can change them uh, based on your understanding of your traffic and your audiences that you're, you're looking for. Uh, and finally, some of the common engagement ones that are now uh, standard in GA version four. Uh, would be scroll depth and downloads. Um, if you're still using universal analytics, otherwise known as Google Analytics version three, uh, you need to add these manually. If you switch to Google Analytics version four, uh, these will be captured automatically. Um, although I think when we uh, work on uh, implementing that for our, uh, our 
clients um, will tweak them a little bit, uh, not super happy with the out-of-the-box implementation, but it is something that you can get uh, quickly uh, just by switching to GA version four. Uh, and with that, I uh, wanted to see if there was any other, any other questions. Um, and if you all wanted to, uh, yeah, I think, I think the, has the link gone out for the, uh, yes, it has. Okay, great. Uh, so there's a link in chat uh, that you can use to join the office hours and we can dive into this dashboard more, show you how to set it up, um, basically answer any, any questions you have around that. And uh, as well, I want to uh, you know leave the last couple of minutes here as uh, for for any questions uh, that you may have immediately if you can't come to that or attend. No, I know everyone's muted. I think you can you can put uh, questions in the chat uh, if you need to, or maybe uh, I don't know. Is, is there a way to uh, to unmute folks? Yeah, if you have any questions, feel, feel free to drop them in, in chat. Um, we're going to close this down in a minute or two so we can open up a new Zoom for office hours. Uh, but thank you so much, everyone, for joining us and uh, diving into the great world of KPIs and content performance dashboards. Um, hope to see you at the office hours. If you can't make it, feel free to reach out uh, to talk to me or Rick or anyone else at Parsons CKO about how we can help you with your data strategy needs. Thanks again for coming.